Yesas, everyone, and welcome to the second Greek Ancestry Summer Webinar. This is part of our broader educational initiative to share knowledge on Greek family history and strengthen our understanding of it. Today's topic, genealogy and ancient Greek philosophy, is very special. Uh, it has never been addressed before, although ancient Greeks had developed quite some interest in tracing their past, uh, their origins. Today, uh, we are very lucky to host a Greek philosophy professor, Dr. Stasinos Tavrianeas, to talk about all this. Uh, Dr. Savrianeas holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Edinburgh. He currently is an assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Patras, Greece. He is an expert on the Aristotelian philosophy of biology and nature. His latest work, a translation and commentary of Aristotle's on how animals move, will be published by Cambridge University Press in July. Stasinos, uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Hi, Greg. Thank you for the invitation. And hi, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. We go a long way back with Greg. And uh, it's, it's a nice opportunity for me as well to try out some ideas uh, in a very new um, topic for me, because I'm not as much familiar with genealogy as Gregory is. Anyway, so I'm sharing uh, the PowerPoint. Uh -huh. And so um, I would like to touch on uh, four topics. I said there are lots of things we could say about what uh, ancient Greeks and especially ancient Greek philosophers had to say about uh, the ancestors and the history and the genealogy and so on. I pick up four um, topics, four questions, four domains, if you like, that correspond to four different aspects of our lives and four different uh, domains of knowledge. Namely, we're going to look at the uh, relation between genealogy and cosmogony, uh, the uh, theories or the accounts of how our world uh, came to be relate in certain ways uh, with our interest in our ancestors. Uh, from, uh, our ancestors in our community, in our family, and so on and so forth. So I want to talk about that a bit. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about biology. And, and we're going to look into Aristotle in particular and what he has to say about the uh, uh, reproductive processes and our relation to our ancestors. Thirdly, uh, I want to look at some aspects concerning uh, the political, the civic life, the politics or the political philosophy. And I'm going to look into Plato in particular. And lastly, I want to try and explore an idea uh, concerning some backward uh, determination, if you like, or affection, not from our uh, ancestors to ourselves, but from our, our own lives and how can they affect uh, our ancestors. So I'm, 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 uh, and the title I gave to this fourth uh, section is Back from the Future. So shall we Wonderful. start? Wonderful. Yeah. So um, uh, tell us, as an introduction, would you like to tell us about the word genealogy, um, genealogia in Greek, its etymology and notion? Did this interest in ancestry concern family lines only, or could we talk about a broader perception of the world and society? Well, um, here is a, like a rudimentary map of how perhaps ancient Greek philosophers, the Presocratics, view our world. And one of the main tasks uh, of the thought of the pre-Socratics is to explain how the world came to be. So this, this domain 
uh, we call cosmogony. And I want to bring out some relation with uh, our interest in genealogy today. The word genealogy, genealogia, uh, is a composite word uh, out of genea, which could mean generation or race, and logos, which means account. It means other things, but I think uh, the best um, rendering here would be account. So an account of our generation, an account of uh, our family history, if you like. That's what genealogy is. I'm not going to go into all the different meanings of the word, but you get the flair of it. So, for instance, uh, one of the uh, great poems of the um, archaic period by Hesiod, Theogony, uh, narrates um, how our world came to be by uh, uh, practically uh, naming all the gods and the entities from the very beginning up to the 12 known uh, gods of, uh, of the Olympians. So everything start, starts there with the uh, house and eros or love and gi or gea or earth. So out of these three primordial powers or uh, divine entities, the rest of the uh, divinities come along in several generations, all the way up to the Olympian gods. And, and this is the way uh, mythology narrates in terms, in genealogical terms, what happens in the uh, realm of the divine. Now, I want to uh, bring this genealogical way of thinking uh, closer to uh, what the ancient Greeks would call physiology. We would call something like physics or natural philosophy or cosmogony. It's again a composite word out of physis, nature, and logos, account, an account of nature, but uh, the word physis or nature has also the meaning of generation, of something that is uh, generated and how it is generated. So an account of nature is at the same time an account of how nature came to be. Okay, so uh, this is the project uh, the pre-Socratics set for themselves to give us an account uh, of how nature came to be. And this is pretty much a genealogical account again. Only that this time we're not going to talk about uh, uh, divine entities, but rather of material entities, say everything comes from water, as we see uh, Thalys will say. And uh, again, there are some uh, common um, uh, elements I want, to, I want us to focus on, we'll see in a moment. Now, what are the common elements? First, uh, methodological uh, uh, considerations. So there is a historical narrative, both in genealogy and in physiology, uh, how the whole thing started, what comes uh, at every stage and so on. And this historical narrative, that's the assumption, will provide us with a rational explanation of the present, will explain why things are the way they are now. Hmm? Going back to the beginnings and, and uh, following the stages of genealogy or the stages of cosmogony will explain why um, the, the status of nature or ourselves is such as it is now. So the, there's a, uh, the method is common in, in, in both areas. Secondly, the target, the target of the enterprise is common. The idea in, in, in cosmogony is to um, bring the plurality of the natural entities under a single common origin. And this is pretty much what is done in genealogy. There is a, a, a plurality, a great variety 
of uh, human beings, or in the case of Hesiod, of divinities. And all these are related step by step back to a common origin. Okay, so the target is again uh, a similar, a similar here. You bring the plurality into uh, a unit, if you like. And thirdly, the practitioners, whether they are historians or like, like Ferekidis or poets like Hesiod or philosopher like Thales, pretty much uh, do both. Uh, they, are, they, have, um, uh, they are active in natural philosophy and they are active in genealogy at the same time, right? So now I want us to, 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 to uh, focus on an idea and I have here a small um, uh, expert from Aristotle on the heavens because I want us to see what I call um, the uh, two uh, worlds theory or the two worlds assumption. Uh, uh, fragment and I explain it afterwards. When they, says Aristotle, and he means the school of Melissus and Parmenides, the so-called Eleatics, one of the most um, uh, eminent schools during uh, the uh, 6th and 5th century BC. So uh, what no one previously has seen, and what is this? That there could be no knowledge or wisdom without some such unchanging entities. They transferred what was true of the unchanging entities to things perceived. Okay. So here there are uh, two realms are distinguished. The realm of divine things, unchanging, indestructible, immortal, imperceptible, object of thought. Okay. And then on the other hand, the realm of our daily middle-sized natural objects, they are changing, uh, they are um, distractible, they are mortal, and they are perceptible. And the idea Aristotle conveys here is, is that there's no way to understand the latter category, the changing things, without assuming that there is an unchanging entity or a realm of unchanging entities. Now, so we have a separation of the divine from the natural environment or the environment of the mortal things. And now there are three options uh, faced with this um, dichotomy of two separate areas or domain. One can do one of the following three things. A, he can try to eliminate or reduce the first realm to the second. That's, that's the line of uh, another pre-Socratic philosopher, Heraclitus. So Heraclitus would say, everything is changing constantly and yet there is rhythm, there is uh, some uh, order in nature, but we don't need to assume a separate uh, realm of unchanging entities. Everything is in constant change and in this changing world we'll find order. Now, to the opposite extreme, B, the Eleatics, eliminate the changing world. They say all that there is are, are these divine entities. That's, that's, that's what truly and fully is. All this world of natural things is just a phenomenon that needs to be eliminated. It's a, a fake uh, reality, if you like. And now between these two extreme, the, the third strategy is to try to find some connection such that the second realm, nature, is explained by the first, the divine. And that's the solution the Milesians try to put forward. That's the solution the Pythagoreans try to put forward. 
and Plato and Aristotle partly as well. And why I have this uh, distinction here of these three ways to um, uh, relate to, to this distinction, because I believe that both genealogy and cosmology, what is ultimately trying to do is to relate somehow um, our present to a divine past, hmm? to something that is there constantly. This idea of some constant factor that somehow even today determines the way things are, something we need to discover. Things are not what they are, are at first impression. We have to do some research and go back either in genealogy or in uh, cosmology and find out what the ultimate uh, somehow um, everlasting character of us. We, we're gonna see more of that uh, in what comes. So, um, so the idea is that both physiology and genealogy uh, think that the changing what is mortal comes from something unchanging, from something that is immortal. And it may be true that uh, we are um, uh, we, we are born and we pass away, but there's something bigger than us, say the family, the clan, the community, and that's unchanging in some sense. Hmm? That's there before we uh, ever uh, get born and it's gonna be there afterwards. So um, genealogy links us to this um, uh, persistent, uh, family or clan or community. Now, Thalys, for instance, uh, says something of that sort when he talks about nature. He says everything comes from water or from the liquid. And what is the evidence for that? Well, the evidence for that is that the sperm of the animal is always in liquid form and food is uh, nutritive and so on, because it's also in liquid form. So this gives him a hint, and there are other hints as well. I mean, it's not a knockdown argument, of course, but it's just, uh, perhaps it's funny as well, but it's it's a uh, educated guess, if you like, yeah? But, and the idea is that this primordial water or liquid is still here somehow in our sperm, if you like, or in our, um, uh, metabolizing nutrition and so on and so forth. Something similar he, does Hesiod when he says that everything came from uh, house, chasm, earth, and love. These three powers are determining what will happen next. So that's, that's um, uh, there are two key ideas here. And with this, I'm going to close this first um, section. Uh, the changing, what is mortal, comes from the unchanging, the immortal. This um, assumption uh, incorporates two key ideas. The first idea is that there is a beginning. There is a beginning beyond which we cannot go. This is our foundation. It is an item for which it makes no sense to ask where it came from. In the beginning, there was water, says Thamis. In the beginning, there was the chaos and eros, uh, says Hesiod. There's no way to ask wha what was before that. That was the beginning. So these items are what I would call explanation stoppers. Okay, there's no, there's no way to go back, uh, further back from that. And, and this is one idea. The, the second idea is that the same element that was there in the beginning survives until today and determines whatever comes next. So there's something in our ancestors, there's something in what was there before the world began that is still here today and somehow determines remotely, we're gonna discuss that if you like, but determines what, what characteristics um, we have and explains ultimately all other features. I'm gonna call this, this idea or um, 
the explanatory grounding. Yeah, there is some kernel, some essence, which is uh, explaining all the other features, if you like. And that's what I had to say about physiology and genealogy up to here, Greg. Yeah, it's interesting. It reminds me also of the of the Christian um, perception. So we all we are all descendants of Adam and Eve, and God created them. So that's uh, like the the explan uh, the explanation stopper. It ends there. But then maybe providence is like what continues uh, later. Yeah, 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 exactly, it's the same. There's some basis um, and, uh, uh, from which everything somehow uh, starts rolling. And I was, w while I was preparing all that, I was wondering, you know, when, when somebody uh, looks backward to his past or the past of his family or the past of his community, um, where does he want to stop? Or in other words, where does my story begin? You know, mm -hmm. part of my family is from the south of Greece, Kalamata. Some other part of my family is from the south of France. Um, where does my family history begin? When these two branches meet in Athens? Or maybe a bit further back? Or a bit further back? You, you have the same problem when you want to say, tell a story, right? And you, you want the story to be complete. But you have to decide where it starts and where it finishes. Right. There's no clear cut. You see what I mean? In, in genealogy, you see it often that people are looking to find the one forefather. Right. Okay. And their um, perception of the of the family tree ends and starts there with one person. Okay, so, so now, apart from these um, mythical uh, perceptions in the culture of symbolism of ancestry, were ancient Greeks, ancient Greek philosophers also interested in the biological aspect of genealogy? In other words, were they interested in what we today know as uh, DNA and genes and uh, genetic inheritance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, concerning the medical or the life sciences, if you th think of medicine and biology as part of the life sciences, we have the works uh, of the so-called Hippocrates. It's not by his own hand, but the hand of pupils in his school and uh, Aristotle's uh, works. And they both need to explain why we resemble our ancestors. Yeah, so there must be a mechanism and that's what similar to uh, the way we look at things. Uh, there must be some explanation why we systematically resemble our ancestors more than we do uh, to other people. So there must be, the assumption is that there must be some mechanism that explains all that. So I choose a, a couple of passages from Aristotle where he tries to uh, answer this problem in some way. And I think uh, there's something interesting to get out of that. So in the generation of animals, he says, some offspring take after the parents and some do not. Some take after the father and some after the mother, in their body or in each of the parts. And that comes the interesting bit. And they take after the parents more than they take after their earlier ancestors, say the grandparents or whatever, and after their ancestors more than after any casual persons. And so there is a gradation of similarity, if you like, or chances of getting um, resembling some of your uh, uh, ancestors. And he continues, males take after their father uh, more than their mother, while females 
take after the mother more than the father. And now he continues, some take after none of their kindred, although they take after some human being at any rate. Others do not take after human being at all in their appearance, but have gone so far that they resemble a monstrosity. So you imagine somebody who gets uh, born with some kind of uh, genetic problem and that he, he's, uh, for Aristotle, he's at the limit of being human, if you like or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that matter, anyone who does not take after his parents is really in a way a monstrosity. Since in these cases, nature has strayed from the kind, the kind human being. So what he, what he does here is this, th there are degrees of resemblance, resemblance. Offsprings take, for the most part, after the parents, but if not, after their ancestors. And if not, that is gonna be, they're gonna resemble other human beings. And if not that, uh, they're going to be human beings in some generic way, if you can imagine that. And things may get worse. Uh, they may resemble something outside the kind human being. So somehow the sperm or the semen carries the information, if you like, uh, so that you can become like your father and I can become like my father. But things may go wrong in this process. The semen um, carries all the information of your ancestral background and the semen relapses, if you like, and, and maybe there are cases which are beyond normality and these are called monsters. So that's, that's one idea which uh, gives some biological uh, uh, dimension to yeah. Uh, it's a biological aspect of uh, ancestry and um, resemblance. Interesting, interesting. Now, um, what was the the political significance of ancient Greek philosophers' perceptions of ancestry? Could you give us some examples of that? Okay, um, I think your connection was not good at that oh. point, so... Okay, so I, I was saying, now let's go to the political aspect of this. Um, could you give us some examples of how all these uh, perceptions um, uh, affect the political life? Okay. Uh, yeah. I decided to, to touch on some bits from Plato, two important works by him uh, are relevant to us. The one is uh, The Republic, uh, a description of a utopian city, uh, which is run according to Platonic standards, as it were. And the other is Timaeus. Timaeus may be the most famous work uh, of, of Plato during the Middle Ages and Renaissance, uh, narrates the uh, creation of the universe. Okay. Uh, but let's, let's and, and contains the famous myth of Atlantis. Now let's go to the Republic where um, uh, at some point uh, Plato criticizes the way popular religion or poetry um, represents uh, divinities or the gods, you know, they're jealous, they're angry, they're, they have all the uh, kinds of misconduct that humans have. And he says, no, look, that's not the way to treat these things. What we have to do is create um, a narrative, what he calls a noble lie, 
a noble fictional story about our past. And this is what we have to offer to our citizens and convince them that they uh, come from a very um, uh, uh, ordained and ordered uh, plan uh, for their life and a very uh, uh, important past. So he says, we want one single noble lie or grand fiction which will be believed by everybody including the rulers ideally but failing that the rest of the city so the noble lie is a myth of national or civic identity uh, uh, referring to some glorious past and this grounds two important claims for Plato. First, the brotherhood of the indigenous people. So we are all brothers here in this utopian city that um, uh, Plato dreams of. Yeah? We all come from this land. In ancient Greek, we are autochthonous, which literally means we come from the earth. And now, now, uh, this is fascinating because exactly it's, it's a cosmogony in a way to use this word point to an origin because of cosmogonical, if you like, order. And that's the one thing he tries to achieve with his noble fictional story. The second is that he justifies the class structure of the city. So the, the myth uh, concerning our glorious past uh, says that the gods mold human beings by putting different metals in their souls. And so each human being is capable of doing a separate uh, work in our society or in our uh, utopian city. And in this way, it justifies um, the, the political program of Plato, which famously includes three main uh, classes, the rulers, philosopher rulers, the uh, guardians, and the producers, if you like. So here genealogy again is used to um, uh, justify both our being one and also our being such that uh, we can offer to the society what the society needs, yeah? Now, unless you want to ask something about that, I will move into um, time news. There is a, a very nice preview, uh, um, an introduction, if you like, to the dialogue and the narrative of the creation of the universe and the start they have discussed the previous day, allegedly, about the constitution and, again, this, the uh, organizing of the city and so on. But they say, uh, look, I, I want to tell you a story about Solon, and uh, Solon went to Egypt, and he met the priests there, and he started uh, telling them uh, about they were telling their own stories. And so in order to boost somehow, Solon started narrating the story of Athens and the reactions of the priest was the following. They say, as for those genealogies of yours, they talked to Solon, as for those genealogies of yours, which you just now recounted to us, Solon, they are no better than the tales of children. In the first place, you don't remember a single deluge only, but there were many previous ones. The, the world goes into destruction and gets created again, if you like. Uh, in the next place, you do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noblest race of men which ever lived. 
and that you and your whole city are descended from a small seed or remnant of them which survived. So uh, Solon knows only part of the story. Yeah. But this story has a much longer uh, distance which he ignores and they continue. And this was unknown to you because for many generations, the survivors of that destruction died, leaving no written word. So this is, uh, um, he mentioned some kind of uh, records one should keep in order to be able to retrieve all this history. For there was a time, Solon, before the great deluge of all, when the city, which now is Athens, was first in war, and in every way the best governed of all cities, is said to have performed the noblest deeds and to have had the fairest constitution of any of which tradition tells under the face of heaven. So again, uh, what we saw before with the noble lie, uh, um, uh, glorious past, which uh, Solon uh, ignores. And lastly, uh, again, from a little further down in Tamius, um, <clears throat> they decide to uh, um, uh, instruct him and give him the story. So they say, you are welcome to hear about them, Solon, said the priest, the Egyptian priest, both for your own sake and for that of your city. So you need to learn for your own sake and for that of your city, you need to learn the story of your city, the story of your uh, clan, the story of your race, and above all, for the sake of the goddess, and they mean goddess Athena here, who is the common patron, but not only that, and parent, and an education, educator of both our cities. She founded your city a thousand years before ours. And now again, receiving from the earth and Ephesus, the seed of your race. So the seed of your race comes not from a human being, but from the earth and Ephesus. And this is, this is an explanation stopper, as we said before, yeah? And afterwards he founded ours and so on and so forth. So again, this idea uh, of looking back and trying to find the origin of our past gives us um, the, 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 the knowledge we need in order to progress. Yeah. And, so, uh, and, 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 and um, inaugurate a constitution that will be um, as important as our past state. And, and this is uh, a discussion between Solon and priests in Egypt? Yeah. So the, the priests in Egypt also trace their ancestry in Greek uh, so, gods. Yes. Greek they're in a better position because they have records. That's what right. they, have. they have the records. This has been a, this has been our uh, problem in Greece, apparently for millennia. <laughs> All right, so let's move to the okay, to the last, the last section. Um, I mean, uh, so okay, so uh -huh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, um, what I, I don't know whether the titles um, do they can you see the titles or yeah yeah know back the, from the future can we affect the past okay so what I'm trying to do here is exploit an idea that is found in Aristotle but it's not uh, uh, quite uh, he doesn't develop it quite the way I think of it but I want to explore um, uh, whether we can affect the past. And here's the idea, you know, this year uh, we celebrate 200 years from the Greek revolution. It's 2021, it was 1821 when the Greek revolution started. And sometimes you get to hear people, um, especially now they reflect on the past and they say, you know, are we as good as our ancestors hoped us, uh, hope, you know, the, the Greeks will uh, be, uh, would our ancestors be proud of us? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, what if, what if, um, let's see, let's see. So Aristotle says, uh, the, the, there are two things I, I want to quote from the Nicomachean ethics. He, again, Solon will be here mentioned. He mentions the story uh, of Solon, um, you know, um, somehow uh, suggesting that you cannot judge whether somebody lived a happy life until you see his last day and then you can say, well, you know, uh, life went okay for him. He had a happy life. You know. Sudden turns of chance may ruin everything somehow. So Solon says, wait until the last minute. And so Aristotle asks, is it the case then that we should not count anyone happy so long as he is alive? Must we agree with Solon and look to a man's end? That, that sounds a bit odd because is it then that one is really happy when one is dead? That sounds accounted into, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, oh, I died, now, now I can be happy. <laughs> something, something goes wrong there. And we're going to talk about this idea. But the second idea is that um, he says, quote, thus the dead do seem to be somehow affected when their loved ones do well and similarly are affected when they do badly. But in such a way and to such an extent as neither to render the happy and happy nor do anything else of that sort. What he means is that our present yeah, uh, have some influence on whether we could say uh, uh, about um, affects our ancestors. It cannot change completely things in the way that from being uh, happy, they will be unhappy, <laughs> but it, it will um, affect uh, to some extent, the reputation, yeah? So let's look into that. So I call this back word ancestry. And the question is, in what way can it be said that we can make our ancestors proud, ashamed, happy, or unhappy? Hmm? To some extent, more or less. In what sense can it be said? Now, there are two ways that we may proceed. Uh, the obvious option is that if there is life after death, eh, if Kolokotronis is still alive somewhere, Karaiskaki somewhere else, and so on and so forth, then one could possibly argue, yeah, I can, if, if things go well in Greece, Kolokotronis will be very happy. Karaiskaki is too, and so on. Eh? Um, but this presupposes that he still cares about us. You know, if there is life after death and, and somebody found himself in a different realm, why should he care about what's happening here? Yeah. So there is a problem here. Uh, then again, they may not be interested in us anymore. Why? what we do is of importance to them. So we're gonna look into this problem in a second, but first the other horn of the dilemma, the other solution is that, well, there's no life after death. Then how can we make sense of backward ancestry in that scenario? Kolokotronis is dead, irrevocably dead, Karaiskakis too, and all these people. But still, we want to say, even if we believe that there's no life after death, we want to say that they would be proud of us and so on and so forth. So we need to give uh, some um, uh, content into that idea. And um, um, the way I want to do it is by considering why death is so bad to us and uh, should we um, 
think that death matter to us? Should we feel sad about our death? And now one famous answer is that for the Epicureans, no way. Death is nothing to us. When we are here, death is absent and where death is present, we are absent. So we don't coincide with death. There's nothing to fear about. But, you know, this sounds like a gimmick, a very clever gimmick, but it doesn't convince people. So nearly everybody says, everybody else says, well, certainly death matters to us because it takes away something extremely valuable. Yeah? Life is extremely valuable. Uh, death takes, uh, sucks the life, the life out of us and therefore um, it matters to us. But what, what is exactly that matters? And I, I want us to consider a case, a scenario. You know, the book by Alfonso Cuaron and the movie, The Children of Man. It, it's a story where New, newborn babies stop being reproduced and the human race will um, uh, uh, will go dead sooner or later. And in such a scenario where it's not just my death, but the death of the human race that's uh, imminent, we can see that uh, our own life will have no meaning. You know? If the world comes to an end in a month's time, it, it won't be any consolation if I live for another two years. So my life is important because the life of everybody else is important. And what matters to us is not just our life, but the immortality of our race, if you like, our community, our family people who will continue sharing our values, promoting the same activities as us, the, the same following up the same projects, projects that perhaps we ourselves won't be able to finish. So what's important to us is um, the immortality of uh, our kind, uh, kind human being. And now, Maybe this gives us an answer to the problem we saw earlier. Now, let me explain that. Uh, our values, if, if, if what I just said is somehow correctly, our values lie very much in our future. What will happen in 10 years or 50 or 100 years, it affects us. It affects what is valuable for us right now. Yeah? I'm, I'm engaged in a project to save the planet because I believe the planet will be uh, you know, flourishing and not be destroyed one year after my death. If, if I know that is certain, I'm going to stop uh, this activity. So how my value lies somehow in the future. Now, if we look back into the past, then the same must be the case for the past. The values of Kolokotronis and Karaiskakis and whoever else, uh, of the great fathers of the nation, hmm? the, their values are affected by what we do today. We can affect in the way that I explained earlier, our future affect, affects me today. My present affects their past. So this gives us a reason uh, to say we need to know more about this past. We need them to understand how this past understood its future and where, where we are vis-a-vis -vis this past. Hmm? Our current values in the present, how do the score relating to this past? And that's, I think that's the message to take on board for, for your project and your tremendous work you do with Greek ancestry. Eh? 
looking back into our ancestors, looking back into our family, our village, our cities, our communities, um, can we discover a sort of continuity between their beliefs and values and practices and ours? Yeah, oh. and, and I think this is what also like Greek Americans, Greek Australians, right? They, um, for them, maybe a, a point of reference is the, the courage, the bravery of their immigrant ancestors who settled uh, uh, in, the, in the new country and succeeded. So for them, the, the, the value, the, 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 the standard, the example lies there. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking it would be interesting to also have a psychologist here to tell us about how, like I'm thinking maybe in Colocotronis, for instance, we see a father whose um, uh, uh, traits we admire and we adopt. And then uh, the reason why we wonder whether Colocotronis would be proud about us, would be proud of us, is exactly our need for uh, paternal um, recognition, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I agree with that, yeah. So what I wanted to say that unbeknownst to us, we carry uh, uh, values and thoughts that are there. Um, it will take some effort for us to look back into the past and understand. You, you talked about bravery, success, immigration. Yeah. We have to somehow look into the story, understand the little details and the niceties that make this story exceptional each time and somehow relieve part of that story. And, that, and that's what will make us wiser and I believe in the end happier. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Th that was a nice closing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for uh, being with us today. Uh, I, we will let you get back to work now. Okay, thank you. I want to say hi to everybody and thank you and uh, wish the best for this summer. Uh, I, I do hope it's special for everybody and happier than last summer. Right, right, right. Good night. Bye.